Okay, hello everyone. Um, good evening to all the audience from uh, the Facebook Live and the YouTube Live channel. So welcome to our um, Money uh, ASP Airport uh, Astronomy Picture of the Day session. So today we are presenting the selected airport for February. So I'm Bunwei. Today, uh, Lai is not able to come. So today, airport panel have Dr. Chong, um, the president of the Astronomy Society, uh, Society of Penang and Jiechin from uh, Johor. He's uh, joined the IO and won medal before. So now studying in college, right? <laughs> so as usual, uh, if um, you have any questions, welcome to leave the comments or the question in uh, our uh, channel. We will have the Q&A session later to answer the questions. So uh, now I would like to start off with uh, today's airport. Let me uh, share my screen. Okay, so today uh, airport is actually showing a nearby uh, spiral galaxy, NGC 4945. Uh, so this is taken from the Stargazer Observatory by Dr. Diet Ma Heger and uh, his partner uh, Eric Benson from Australia. Uh, so from this photo, actually, uh, is showing the NGC 4945 is a uh, nearly edge on galaxy and almost size of our uh, Milky Way galaxy. Also has the swirling uh, spiral arm and a bar shaped central region. So uh, this is also this is um this has the dusky this uh young blue star cluster and the pink star forming the region stand out in the colorful telescopic frame so uh ngc 4945 is a galaxy in the centaurus constellation uh, situated south of the celestial equator so it's easily to visible from the southern parts or from the Australia part. Lah. So actually this uh, NGC 4945 is about uh, six times further away from the Andromeda and 30 million light years distant towards the expansive southern constellation Centaurus. So in the core of the NGC 4945, it actually emits uh, a very high energy of the X-ray. So it, uh, the uh, scientists, they, they are trying to prove that inside have a very uh, super massive black hole and it is a Stafford uh, galaxy. Okay, so uh, next one, I would like to go to the uh, my favorite photo in uh, February because I see it has a Christmas tree. <laughs> okay, uh, this one is the Christmas tree, but it's not the 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 Christmas tree. It's actually the uh, Green Bank Telescope. Yeah. So uh, this photo is taken by uh, Dave Green, uh, an amateur photographer. So this photo is actually taken one month to prepare, um, based on the count. Uh, the calculation and the planning and using the Google Earth um, and several apps to 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 make this uh for uh, background and the foreground with the GBT. Uh, Robert C uh, Bridge Green Bank Telescope. So this uh telescope's uh GBT telescope is the largest fully portable single dish radio telescope in the world. It has 100 meter diameter collecting area. From this photo may not be able to see, but uh, it is uh, very, very huge, uh, larger than a football field. So this one is actually taken from uh, very far. And the uh, GBT, the secondary reflector is held by an off axis support structure to minimize the radiation from the ground and the unwanted reflection. So it also located in the National uh, Radio Quiet Zone in the hills of West uh, Virginia, USA. So this place is actually offering a very unique protection from the for the radio telescope because they want to detect the, all the radio frequencies. So have to away from the human uh, made 
uh, man-made interference, like <coughs> the use of the cell phone, the Wi-Fi, and even even the microwave uh, oven uh, limited from that area. So going there couldn't bring the phone or anything uh, if you want to visit the GPT. So the pointing accuracy of the GPT is actually about two arc second and able to resolve a quarter at three miles. Um, the surface of the GPT is perfectly smooth to noise level of 260 microns. And it actually operates uh, about 6,500 hours every year. So more than 25 million have been investor in this GBT in past five years, according what I found. Out. So <clears throat> this uh, GBT is also uh, discovered by many, uh, many uh, get galaxy or many study many uh, the universes uh, study a lot. So including one of the discoveries including a large coil shape uh, magnetic field in the Orion uh, molecular crop. So actually this photo taken by um, this uh, photographer is actually trying to to have a very well fit uh, background because if you can see this one is actually oops, uh, an Orion. So um since the gbt is famous with the unusual magnetic field in the orion molecular cloud complex so he took this with the orion background is very very uh need to be very well planned and um very creative so from this photo we can see this has a bonnet look and this um uh, is an emission nebula in the Orion and originate from a supernova about 2 million years ago. Uh, it's about 1,600 light years away from Earth and made up with plasma and the red color is actually from the hydrogen gas. And if I think in a large place we can see with our naked eyes. And yeah, of course this is the famous Orion belt and the Orion Nebula and also the Lambda Orionis is actually a open star cluster uh, with about like 5 million years old and about 1,300 light years away from the sun. So this is a very, very super cool image um, taken by uh, Dave Green uh, at uh, actually, he take this. Uh, he took this in uh, end of January. Yep. So okay. So I will proceed to the next one. Is the uh, this one is the illustration of a uh, early quasar. So so this is an illustration um, from an early quasar like from the uh, caption here. So this one uh, is illustrated from the Dr. M uh, from the ESO. So I think we can't capture the real image of the quasar yet la, because it still remain mysterious. Uh, so quasar is actually a very, very powerful and emitting many, many um, very <clears throat> powerful energy in radiated light compared to other stars in our galaxy. So some quasars is also observed to shooting out pairs of light uh, straight jets like this one uh, close to the speed of light and to a very far beyond the galaxies they live in. So they can actually give out his energy to a uh, very far away or from very far away if we are looking back to it. So, um so this one is actually also from a super massive black hole uh or or we call it as a quasar because quasar is a quasi stellar radio source it's not a star and 
um, shallowed it with the sheet of gas and and ex excretion this and also this one is the uh, powerful jet that from the from the cross uh. so mm -hmm. not every black hole can be a cross uh, actually uh, it have to be very very uh, the, the mass need to be enough and super massive enough to actively feeding on the material and also the infallent uh, metal uh, will so into a disc and then heat up and then and then giving out the energy so Hasa is uh, discovered in uh, 1960 so that time actually Hasa is a puzzle uh, until now also stay mysterious uh, when they are first discovered so they, the astronomer uh, studied the rate shift of the radio source and found that the the red sheet of the quasars is actually from the expansion of the universe and so the quasar can be coming from a very very far away of the uh, universe uh, like uh, many light years ago probably from since the big uh, the big bang and the study about the quasar can give us uh, more information for more information about the early and intervening uh, universe. So the earliest, uh, the oldest uh, quasar that found, the oldest quasar that found and known now is uh, named as uh, P172 plus 18, which actually um, also discovered by the ESO. La. So um, I've seen about 700 million years ago uh, after the Big Bang. So that is uh, when the universe are just a few percent at its um, current age now. So uh, even I found from uh, Google, the nearest uh, the nearest quasar actually you also located six, 600 million light years away. So actually it's still far away from us and it is um, this uh, quasar is actually from um, Macaron two three one and is powered by two central black holes pulling each other. So it has the two uh, black holes swirling together and giving out the quasar for this uh, nearest one. Uh. And so I will go to my uh, last airport today. My last one, uh, but after that, I will pass to other people. <laughs> I will pass to Dr. Chong. So the, the last one is, uh, this one is the open cluster and in puppies. In puppies, this is taken by uh, Dr. De. Uh, he's, he's an amateur uh, astronom astronomer. And this photo is actually taken at uh, Orion Belt Remote uh, Observatory, uh, Mayhill, uh, New Mexico. So this, uh, actually this photo, according, I, 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 I searched from uh, Dr. Dave, uh, he said that this uh, actually can also see with, see through with uh, binoculars, the magnification will have to be 16 times 70. So you can also see these three three open cluster in uh, uh in the puppies. So it's around uh serious to puppies la, the, I uh, when I try to find that. Uh, so this one uh is actually three cluster is what um this one is the NGC uh two four two three. So this is a is an extra solar planet and the, uh, orbiting in, of one of its red giant stars. So to another one, to a lower left one is actually this one. This one um, actually is a M46 and you can also see uh, the <coughs> NGC 2438 here. This one is the uh, NGC 2438 uh, and this one, uh, NGC 2438, is a 
is sent is a <coughs> planetary uh, nebula. Uh, is uh, central star is actually a dim white dwarf with the surface temperature is about uh, seventy five thousand Kelvin. Uh, so it's actually a hottest uh, stars. Uh, one of the hottest stars and it contains actually the material in jet from the central star during the asymptotic uh, giant run. So for this uh, N, uh, M46 is about 5,500 light years away and it contains a few hundred stars in a region of the 30 light years across. So so yeah uh, so and then we can actually see this one this one is the m47 so uh actually you can uh, very very easy to spot these two cluster and m47 is actually younger compared to uh, m46 is now is about 80 million years and 1,600 light years distant from us. It's a smaller and looser star cluster. And there have also about 500 stars and mostly contains a high temperature giant blue star. So you can see a blue, blue one. Uh, so this one is also uh, explaining the, the cluster is uh, still young. Uh, so actually in between of this uh, <coughs> Uh, two uh, NGC is still have one small and dim cluster, which is this NGC two four two five. And there, yeah. So there is there is the three uh famous open cluster. So the open cluster is a uh, star cluster made up of a uh, few thousand stars. So can try to have a binocular and try to look at the puff piece to see whether you can see any. So, okay, so I will pass to, the next is Dr. Chong, right? Yes. So I will pass to Dr. Chong and stop sharing now. Thank you, Wenwei, right? So this is the one, uh, here you see, uh, uh, Pebble 17, Chevrolet Molecular Club, but before I show the picture, uh, can you hear me, uh, Wenwei, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, okay. So basically, I'll say Jom. What I mean by this Jom, Justin and Bumbe? Let's go for astro tourism. So basically, when we show this airport, uh, what they call session every year, every month, we actually making a kind of astro tourism tourism trip throughout the universe. So just now, already Bumbe show a few places. So just like some people said, astro tourism doesn't mean that you go to a dark place in Malaysia, you go to the Himalayas mountain. You go to the to the Attica, all right. You go to the Norway to see the the, the what they call this the aurora, all right. To do astro tourism, just astro tourism. For us, astro tourism means three dimension. We travel in three dimension to tour the universe. So the astro tourism tour, we will continue, all right. February the 17, 2022. Okay, it's a fantastic molecular club. I will show in uh, the whole picture first. Then I will show the bigger size. So basically, it's like this. So now you see, it's um, uh, February 17, 2022. It's a giant molecular cloud, Chameleon 1 molecular cloud in the constellation of Chameleon. Chameleon, we know, is a kind of lizard that can change color, la, right? And it's near to the South Pole. That means the sun constant. Look at the density of the clouds, right? So I give you information here. It's actually uh, acquired by this funny love Wolski, but I couldn't find out from which country, yeah? but he could be a student studying in America. But the processing is done by Robert Ader, another amateur astronomer, all right? So basically, it's a place where, so this is what we call it, Terra Nursery, Tarika Bintang, where the stars are being formed. So basically here, you see here, clouds, or right? this, this dark dust clouds huh, are actually blown off by the early stars that died. Remember, when the star is dying, you blow up not just hydrogen helium, right down the periodic table. Right until especially the normal star form, uh, what they call this uh, hydrogen to iron. But if it's a supernova explosion from iron to gold, lead, and so on, so basically, 
Well, it's your normal star, that means from hydrogen to iron. That means the or silicon is there. And you have this star cloud. But don't get the idea that if you are to go into this star cloud, you go at uh, you do a space walk, you open your space suit, <coughs> you're choked by the dust. No. Actually, even at the densest part of the cloud here, the it's like a better than the best vacuum on planet Earth. But how come so? Why so thick one? Because there's a huge, many, many millions and millions of cubic light years of the of the space there. So it looks very dense. Actually, it's like a vacuum. But anyway, here the the what do you call the dust here and the material here is enough to collect due to gravity and new stars will be born here. So a lot of information here. For example, you have also a V shape, V shape, chamberlain infrared nebula in infrared. So like this and so on. So in a sense, this place will wait long enough. New exoplanet will be born, new stars will be born. And do not think that. Imagine, say this 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 uh dense cloud of uh, what they call dust, huh? it could be, I don't know, could be say a few cubic uh, light years of dust. Huh? Doesn't mean that it will collapse to form many, many stars. So it seems huh, from the astrophysics of this accretion disk, huh, accretion that is a uh, remember, it's always like that. When you have a cloud of gas and dust in space, always like a big lump, three-dimensional, like a like a sphere. It collapses always like a pancake. So for us in Malaysia, it's what chapati la, what and then it will rotate. So when it collapses, it will be very small. So the 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 cloud is actually maybe cubic, many cubic like this. But it collapses to a small part, maybe a big few times bigger than so and we will rotate fast. So only. 1% of the material in the dust cloud will collect to form the solar system, the star system. The 99% fail to form. So we are actually solar system. It's the 1% of the portal solar nebula that collect to form us. So you see a very beautiful, so a lot of information here, all right? We go to the next one is 15 of February. Uh, this is very nice. Uh, first of all, I will, what you call, make, make it last first, to read, the people read. You look at the moon picture carefully, huh? hey, something is funny, huh? When I look at it, why like that one? When I read it, oh, so basically, it's uh, by NASA. Remember, there's still another NASA moon orbiter in, in the polar orbit, huh? polar from north to south pole of the moon. It's by Lunar Reference Orbiter. And the processing is by our NASA Scientific Visualization Studio. And the processing is by these two. Uh, I would think that they could be students from India. But they are in uh, Houston, Texas. Right? Uh, it's about 18 years old. Only. These two boys from India, they are there and they process it. So basically, it's like this. I will show how they process. Very, very nice idea. They call it the what? The face tech moon. So let's see how they process it. You get the idea, uh, Michael. Maybe you can try it with Hengi. Yeah, very nice. So basically, like this, he took uh, the the moon, uh, all the phases, uh, from new moon to quarter moon to full moon to third quarter moon to old moon, and then he took only the part. Remember, so basically, normally when you have the normal moon, say this, this is not a full moon, no. Because if you have a full moon, you look carefully, the craters got shadow. You cannot have shadow one. Full moon don't have a shadow. So that means this is the part where at the part where the terminator, terminator was near this area. And so this part that terminated this area, and this part terminates. So everywhere there's a terminator. So basically, he took the whole cycle of the moon, 29 days, and each of the the face of the moon where the termin near the terminator, the craters are very distinct. 3D, 3D effect, huh? and he only stitch up those parts that are near the terminator. So it's called the face tech moon. Very nice, you know. So this is a, if you want to, uh, what I call, give an astronomy lesson on the moon to the people, uh, the student, you can use this. So very nice idea. Face tech moon. 
which any energy can fly, all right? Very nice, all right? You look at the details. Very, very nice. Maybe you can ask uh, 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 Michael, try again, Hingi, or we can go back to uh, Tech Room on Vegi to try there, all right? So the next one is 13. Uh, this one is, I think everyone should know, but we think it's very interesting, all right? The Earth at Night, all right? And then it's taken by NASA, and there is a, a, a object called or what is called Sumi NPT, all right? Sumi, uh, and uh, there's a BIIRS, which is a visible infrared imaging radiometer suite, all right? And of course, Doctor Nigel Roman is uh, one of the astronomers. In, uh, remember, NASA huh, got many many centers in America, so this is GSFC, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And processing is by done by one of the one of the person in Joshua Steven. Joshua Steven works in NASA's Earth Observatory. So now we go into this. You look at it. You, you must have seen it before, lah. But basically, the Earth at night has been taken by many satellites orbiting the Earth. But this is by this Sumi uh, NTT uh, Observatory. So you can see the whole world. For us, we are more interested in Asia. Okay. So you can even enlarge it. Okay. To Asia, can see Penang, ah? can see there you are, and so this, so West Coast a lot of light pollution, and here of course Penang Island will have battle a lot of pollution, okay, and then of course KL, all right, Johor Bahru and Singapore, all right, East Coast also a bit of pollution, all right, and then all over Asia you can see pollution, I see yeah. So basically, if you want to do stargazing Malaysia, you don't do around the Klang Valley or the West Coast. You go somewhere in the central part of the peninsula, all right? Like Pahang, Lantan, and so on, all right? And then you see other parts of the world, good for Sabah, Sarawak, or right? well, Kalimantan, even better, all right? Of course, a bit of light pollution here, which is, I, I think it's Kota Kinabalu and so on. And then here you see uh, in China, a lot of light pollution. A lot of light. Oh, but Bangkok, Bangkok, all right, a big population, all right. China, of course. There you are, our Guangdong and this Pearl River uh, Delta and Hong Kong, west coast of Taiwan or right, Shanghai area, Beijing, and of course you see here South Korea. North Korea, not much light pollution because I think at, at night they don't switch on the all the street lights and so on. And of course in Japan, also, all right. Japan also here, Tokyo, Tokyo area and the Osaka area. So basically, this one uh, very nice. All right. So you look at the light pollution around the world at night. All right. So very nice. But still a lot of places in the world that are quite dark. All right. So like in Africa, uh, in the in the Amazon jungle, Central Africa, and so on. So a lot of places dark. In Malaysia, also some places still dark. Huh? So this, this is it. So next one is the 12. Again, Aurora by Moonlight. So our Lai Hengjun likes Aurora, why? Right? Because he spent one of the, I think years ago when we were studying USM, I think he spent nearly one year in in, uh, in the university in Uppsala, in Sweden, all right? So this is Aurora by Moonlight, all right? Taken by P.M. Hayden. He's a famous amateur astronomer in Sweden and he takes a lot of Aurora pictures, all right? So this is Aurora by Moonlight near Stockholm, capital city of Sweden, all right? And then you see, there's a, of course, geom, that means when the aurora, that means there's a geomagnetic storm on the sun, but this is the case where the geomagnetic storm is not very, not very strong. So the aurora here, not very, not very strong. But if you are there, you can easily see with your own eyes. No need to use uh, 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 long exposure. You can see with your own eyes here. So this aurora in Sweden, so where can we see aurora? All right, so now remember the sun is getting more and more active. Huh? We hope that we can see aurora near equator. Remember, 1991, I saw in the sky in telescope magazine that someone in Singapore observed aurora. They will say whether he took a picture with long exposure or with the own eyes. Huh? But normally, the aurora can, can be seen in northern Europe, all right, which is our this uh, what is called Scandinavian country, all right, Norway, Sweden, Finland, all right. And of course, not northern Siberia. In the west part is of course uh, northern USA, the, the Canada, right, and Alaska. And over here in the 
For us, nearby is, of course, Southern Australia, New Zealand, and of course, Antarctica and Arctic. So in Malaysia, we normally don't see aurora, right? So very nice. So we'll go to the next one, which is our 10 October, no, 10 February. Uh, this one must explain more. Again, dust cloud, right? Okay, so it's, it's our T Tauri, which is this star. There you are, not the one on the right, the one on the left here. T Tauri is a famous star, no? In astronomy, you know, many of the astronomers did their PhD work studying this star, T Tauri. Tauri means what? The adjective for Taurus constellation. So in Taurus constellation, there's a star called T Tauri. And many of the young stars are, are classified as T Tauri. So stars are like people, different character, different behavior. So this T Tauri star here, all right, and the Heinz Variable Nebula. So Heinz Variable Nebula is just to the right of T Tauri, this nebula. It's called Heinz Nebula. And because its intensity can change with time, so it's a Heinz Variable. Variable doesn't mean in size, in light intensity, all right? So look at the details here, all right? Okay, so this is about 650 light years, and it seems that this object is near the local bubble. Local bubble doesn't mean you buy a chewing gun from the local 7-Eleven uh, store. That is a local bubble. Local bubble is this. Ah. There you are. Now, do you know that our Earth, our whole solar system, and many of the stars, many, many hundreds of light years around our our sun are in the so-called local bubble. What's a local bubble? It's like this. And you look outside this, there are also other bubbles. No? So basically that, imagine that the whole solar system and many stars near the sun started in a uniform space. Meaning that, remember, the space in between the stars and galaxies is not empty, you know. Got atoms, you know, hydrogen, helium, dust particle. So imagine we start at uniform. Now. But then, from time to time, there's a star that go old somewhere here, Mosca constellation, and that blow up. So blow up what short wave. So this short wave will move to space and will push away the stars, uh, the dust particle here, the, the atoms in the space. And a lot of other stars will blow up. No need to be super wild, just a normal, normal explosion. So it will carve out this bubble. Quite long, you know, the, this bubble is in the length is about 1,000 light years. Our sun is right inside. So you have, you have a huge bubble, but it's called it the local bubble, right? Meaning that our sun and some of the stars are, are in it. So this is a local bubble. But you do not think that, again, that this bubble here, wow, the plasma here, electron, proton, and the ions, or ions, are very dense. No, it's better than any vacuum on the Earth. But the astronomers, the scientists, can measure the density of the electrons and plasma here. They can measure and they found that the, the, the distribution, the density of the space here changes. So at the boundary, there's a sudden jump up in the density. All right? It's a vacuum, but the density, and it follows this shape. So we call it the local bubble. Our whole solar system is embedded in the local bubble. So this is at the boundary of the local bubble, where this occurred. Right? I've got taken by this. Dawn Lowry is a group leader. She's a woman, huh? Gian Lorenzo Peretti. I think he's from Italy, but he works in Chicago, in America. Ewa Pasiak and Terry Felty. So nowadays, uh, they will never say, this group use what telescope, la, what uh, what they call camera. Just assume that you are already an expert astrophographer. They do not give you any details. Previously, they will give you all the details of the telescope and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the photography technique. And so now no need, they assume you are good. So this is Steve Fowley and Heinz Variable, uh, what they call Nebula. So this is a lot of things can be can be done here. Let's look at it. A lot of details here. Okay. So we continue now. 8th of February. Again, Aurora. Ah, this is a better Aurora. <laughs> Lai likes Aurora. He was in Sydney. Just look at it. And always I like it, the person here. All right. And I don't know whether this person is our Alexon Korea. All right. From the name Korea, it looks like he could be an Italian. I thought check couldn't find from which country. And it's from a place called Kautukeno, Norway. Somewhere in Norway. So basically, you have an aurora in the sky, all right, on the left. And basically, in this part, means what? Means that the sun got a kind of uh, uh, energetic activity. 
it blew up a lot of charged pl plasma that uh, that come towards the Earth at the faster speed than the normal solar wind. Remember, the normal solar wind will take about uh, what they call uh, five days to leave the sun to reach the Earth. But sometimes this very uh, uh, what they call solar flare or solar activity it will reach the Earth in a few hours. So what happened is the charged particle will interact with the air molecules at the upper atmosphere. So it doesn't mean that wow, this green cloud is just about the tree top. Lah. No, many hundreds of many kilometers in the, in the space. Oh no, in the sky. Remember, space is 100 kilometers higher than the Earth. Below that is atmosphere. So this could be tens of kilometers from the Earth's surface, maybe up to 100 kilometers. So what happens is the electrons and the ion will knock out some of the electrons around the oxygen molecules or nitrogen molecules in the upper atmosphere and the electron knock off. So the, 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 those empty shells that have been created uh, will be filled in by the other electrons still inside the oxygen or, or nitrogen mo molecule. So when the electrons fill up the empty field, field they'll give up this line, emission line. And because it is a quantum mechanics phenomena, they, it can be measured, they're all discrete emission lines. So if you have a spectrometer, you can measure that it's a discrete uh, line and it's in a green color. So it doesn't mean that green to your eye is only one green, but for us, it's many, many discrete lines in the green color, right? Given out by the oxygen. If you have nitrogen atom, can give it also different colors. And on the right, you have the light dealers. Right, so there are two phenomena, not, not outside the Earth's atmosphere, within the Earth's atmosphere, aurora, all right, created by the sun, the charged particle from the sun come to the Earth, interact with the Earth's air, uh, air molecule, and generate this uh, aurora light. But here also you have light pillar. So basically, light pillar is like this, okay? So you have light pillars. Wait a minute. Oh, wait, wait. You're going to look at the light pillars. They have this. Okay. There. there you are. There's a phenomenon of light pillars, and this is how they are formed. There you are. I make it bigger. So basically, this is a light pillar. It doesn't mean that light pillar. So it's, a, it's an, actually an optical illusion. It doesn't mean that the light is there. It's actually many, many of the ice particles high up in the Earth's atmosphere, they are flat and they are aligned. The flat surface is aligned parallel to the Earth's surface. So what happened is here you have an artificial light created by human being, all right? And this artificial light will hit the flat part, the lower part of the ice crystal, come back to the Earth human eye here, and this human eye will see it, and you, you go and draw it, put, you project it backwards, they all seem to come from this thing. So as you caught by reflection at the bottom surface of this uh, flat ice particle. So basically what? So this ice particle, somewhere far away in the horizon, there's a city, la, a town, a lot of street light, car light, house light, and usually house light, street light, white, white color or yellow color. Right? So scattered back on the flat, bot, lower flat surface of this ice particle and is seen by this. So they're very nice, no? Aurora caused by the sun interacting with the Earth's molecule. And this is the light pillars caused by the reflection of ice particle of the street light of a far away town coming to your eye. So very nice. And so you're holding out the left hand for Aurora, right hand for this light pillar. Very nice. Alex Correa. So this, I find that this is it's not just a, a photo. It's a piece of art to me. Very nice piece of art. All right. We go to the, the next one, 7 of February. All right. I'll read it. Make it big first. Wow. <laughs> hey, what is this? Shooting up something. NGC 4651, the umbrella galaxy. You look like umbrella, no? Oh, there's the umbrella there. It looks to me. If you don't know as well, oh, teacher, teacher. There's a rain from the universe coming in here. And so this uni uh, this galaxy is holding an umbrella. La. It looks like that. So it's called umbrella galaxy. So this one is by uh, CFHT. Remember in Mauna Kea, of extinct volcano in Hawaii. There are many, many big telescopes. One of them is the Canada France Hawaii telescope. That means invested by Canada, country, France, country, Hawaii means University of Hawaii, America telescope, big optical telescope. And by Colum. Colum is actually an amateur uh, Italian astronomy 
magazine. Astronomy magazine in Italy. And Mega Cam is a big CCD camera in the CFHD, Canada Plant Hawaii Telescope. And JC Guillaume, uh, Gu uh, Guillaume is a uh, professor of astronomy in, in the CFHD Observatory. And this astronomy is, I think, the editor, editor of the Italian astronomy magazine. And look at that. Whoa, so nice. Okay. So basically, it's like that's what. So this is another case of, all right, if you have seen it from the Hubble picture more than 20 years ago, what? Galactic collision. This is a big accident in the space. Why? There's, there's a big uh, galaxy here, and there's a smaller galaxy that will pass up, that has passed up and down this galaxy many times. So this, the center galaxy, gravity being bigger, so it create the tidal, uh, what they call fossil, and strip the other galaxy out of its, uh, what they call star. So it, the stars will trail around it, so it look like an umbrella. And this is, I see the handle on the umbrella. So for example, we know that our large and small mentioning cloud, the two galaxies, I want to see your okay. face. This is our, our Milky Way galaxy. Right now, below here, large Magellanic cloud and small Magellanic cloud. Actually, our large and small Magellanic cloud is actually given time will penetrate to the, the main plane of Nikki Nikki galaxy, go to the upper nord, northern part and plunge to the, again, the disk of the galaxy and go down. And as you do that many times, they will strip off the stars. So the trail of stars will follow the, the, the large and small Magellanic cloud. So imagine... If you have other uh, uh, aliens on in other uh, galaxies near our Milky Way, look our Milky Way. Maybe they can see this thing. So our large and small magic club is actually orbiting this, and we can see it. All right, like this, huh? So fantastic, huh? So this is our umbrella galaxy. All right. So what happened in the end? So in the end, if the two smaller galaxy will be what eaten, huh? Gasa will be merged with this galaxy into one, but it will not take tomorrow or no. Remember, anything on a galaxy scale will take hundreds of millions of years, or maybe billions of years, all right? So like this. So our Milky Way galaxy has two dwarf galaxies, and also the dwarf galaxy may create this, pheno uh, this phenomena seen by aliens on other galaxies near to our Milky Way, all right? So this is a kind of uh, galactic collision, all right, between a big galaxy and other smaller galaxies okay so i think that's all for me i pass over to uh Jatin. okay okay thank you dr Chong. yeah yeah all right so the first report i'm going to present is uh this picture here the 6th of february uh so this is a very very interesting planet the planet that's most people is very familiar with, okay? So this is Earth, okay? The most beautiful planet out there. And it is taken by the Apollo 17 crew, uh, NASA. So Apollo 17 crew is actually the last, uh, it's the last Apollo crew that uh, actually landed on the moon, uh, it's back in 1972. So this photo is actually very old already. It is around, uh for around 50 years old already so yeah so, but even though this is a very old photo this is a very very classical and historical photo and a lot of astronauts like uh, when they go up there uh, nowadays they don't go to the moon anymore they go to the iss but they still see the curvature of the earth and see the oceans and see the uh see the greenery the life out there the mountains out there the cities, the lights of the cities at night. So they will feel this, uh, the sense to protect Earth, to, to identify themselves as, uh, as, as someone who really loves Earth. Lah. Because if you look, if you look with your real eyes, uh, sorry about that. Okay. So yeah, if you look with your real eyes up there, look at the Earth, then yeah it, it will be truly beautiful like even me i'm looking at the picture right now uh, it's quite beautiful imagine you're looking at it in your with your real eyes out there so yeah this is taken in 1972 and yeah it's a very beautiful 
picture. I think it's one of the most beautiful A-Port pictures out there. Okay. So let's go to the 5th of February. So this is a very interesting picture. It's an extra galactic picture. Uh, it's actually a variable star R Aquarii. Aquarii means that it is in the constellation of Aquarius. Okay. So variable star means that the brightness of this object changes uh, with time. So here you also mentioned that if you use, even you, if you don't have any detectors or specialized equipment with your own naked eye, you can actually notice that it changes its brightness over the course of a year. So yeah, if, you, if as long as you have a binoculars, you can you can even see that it changes the brightness. So a lot of people think that uh, the sky doesn't change. Like every night they look at the stars, the star doesn't change, the star is permanent. But actually no, like this is one example out there that even in the very short time scale even in a time scale of one year the stars not not just the planets that move around the stars themselves actually change so this is a very good example of it but another thing that's special about this picture is that it's also a composite pictures like okay these colors are actually fake colors la. these are uh, colors assigned by scientists to the values uh photometric values that they collected through their telescopes. So it's actually uh, two wavelengths, two bands of wavelengths. One is from the X-ray, uh, is from the Chandra X-ray uh, telescope. So Chandra X-ray telescope is, uh, yeah, Chandra X-ray observatory. It's, uh, it's one of the space observatories out there that measures in X-ray. So one of the reasons why you don't see X-ray observatories on the ground is because uh, most of the X-rays from outer space, by the time they reach the surface, is already absorbed by the atmosphere. So if you want to uh, observe X-ray, uh, extra uh, celestial X-ray sources, you need to have a space observatory. So Chandra uh, does that. So yeah, actually Chandra itself is a very interesting observatory. La. Like Chandra, the name is named after a white dwarf, uh, the white dwarf limit. So when it, when the star goes through uh, like 1.44 uh, solar mass, then uh, it cannot be supported uh, by electron degenerative pressure already. So it will it will collapse into a neutron star. So yeah, that's the Chandrasekhar uh, limit. And in fact, here itself, there's actually a white draw. So if you can see, this is actually a very chaotic picture. There's actually, uh, it's actually a stellar system. So there's actually one red giant star and then one white dwarf star. So these two stellar celestial objects, they orbit around each other. And even though the white dwarf star is very, very small, like usually the white dwarfs are usually the size of planet Earth and then red giants are hundreds or even ton, hundreds or even hundreds of thousand times larger than the sun. Uh, like you're comparing, comparing basically a basketball to a grain of sand but even that they actually are almost uh, considerable uh, portions of mass to each other so yeah actually they, they are in mutual orbit around the common center of mass and the white dwarf is actually sucking a bit of the red giant star so like what we said just now chandra this this guy chandraska limit if you go past a certain mass limit then it will collapse under its own uh, gravity into a neutron star. So that's actually what happened here. So if you see the explanation here, the material by the giant star is put by gravity into the white dwarf and then triggering a thermonuclear explosion. So yeah, once you have uh, you have enough gravity, then you can trigger a thermonuclear explosion. So this is what happened here. Boom. This is an explosion. So yeah, even though like, yeah, like it, the star itself, it also has uh very like periodicity because I think I think they didn't explain why they have a change of brightness over a year, but I think it's related to uh the obscurement of its light by the materials bursted out from the star. So yeah, this is a very interesting picture. And yeah, there's, uh, the visible light component is taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. So the visible light is in red and blue, and then the purple part here is the X-ray. Okay, so 
uh, our third picture is the 4th of February, uh, moons at twilight. So yeah, this is a very nice picture by uh, Mr. Robert Fedez. So a lot of people think that when they see the crescent moon, uh, they actually cannot see the, the rest of the other moon. They will somehow think like the other moon is like disappeared or totally invisible. But actually that's not the case. If you, if you use a camera and then you set up a exposure, you can see that the, obviously the moon is still there and there's still light reflecting from it. So what, what light is it? Like it can be light reflected from the earth to the moon or uh, light refracted from the atmosphere of the earth into the moon. So that's that's one of the reasons why uh, even at lunar eclipse, the, you can see the moon in red also. So yeah, uh, yeah, you can see the moon even uh, when it's crescent. So yeah, this is this is what the naked eye sees. But if you do a long exposure, then you can see the moon. But that's not the only thing here. The, the one special, the the another thing that makes this photo special is that you can see this special celestial object here that somehow has some companions right here. So this is actually Jupiter and its moons. And yes, like even though this is a macroscopic picture, like you can see actually trees here. If you look carefully, yes, you can even see the moons. But usually uh, you cannot see the moons because uh, yeah, this is an exposure. So that's why you can see the moon outshining against the dark sky. Uh, yeah. So usually uh, if you use your naked eyes, it's very hard to see. But if you look carefully, you can actually see all the four Galilean moons. So one, two, three, four. So uh, it is in the order of Io. I wait, let me check. Hold on. So this is in the order of Ganymede, Io, Europa, Callisto. So Ganymede, Io, Europa, Callisto. So Callisto is the furthest one. You can see this. Even this is not just a coincidence. Like if you can go that far, then this is definitely Callisto already. The others, the orbit usually end around uh, somewhere here, but Callisto can go quite far. Uh, you can see like that it's almost like I don't know tens of maybe ten arc seconds or something. Yeah, uh, four, four or five arc seconds or something. Yeah, and yeah, this is a very interesting picture because. Uh, there's five moons inside the picture. I mean, five moons that we can see inside the picture. This is our moon, and then this is four other moons on another planet. So yeah, this is a very interesting picture. And you can, yes, you use your binoculars to see the Galilean moons. Okay, so 3rd of February. So maybe you guys can have a guess. Uh, what is this? So these are two different celestial objects. The right one is... Okay, these are two different celestial objects, okay? It's not the same, okay? So this is uh, something that we are familiar, that we are, that we know very well. Okay, so this is an amateur photograph, uh, yeah, amateur astronomy photograph. So this is something that you capture on Earth will be very blurry. So the answer is this one is actually our moon and this is Venus and yes, uh, Venus also have phases because it is an inferior planet. Uh, but uh, yeah, the similarities between the moon and the Venus is that uh, their light is reflected from the sun and then they experience phases as the elongation of Venus changes and the phase angle of the moon changes. So that's why they have phases. But the difference is that the moon can go right behind the earth so that's why you can see the full moon. But the Venus is a inf is an inferior planet. So it never go behind the Earth. In fact, the most it can go is just uh, around uh, 40, 40 degrees away from the sun, not 180 degrees like the moon. It, it can at most go to 40, uh, around 40 degrees. That's when the when they call the greatest elongation happens. So when that happens, maybe it's just almost because 40 is almost like almost half of it is getting illuminated, but never more than half of it. So yeah, this is one of the similarities and the difference uh, between Venus uh, and the moon. So does that mean that other inferior planets, like the other one, like Mercury also demonstrate phases? Yes, Mercury also have phases. But because uh, it can only go like, I think almost 20 degrees away from the sun, 
so yeah, the their face is the variation of face for Mercury is even less. That's all when it's maximum elongation, you can only see a crescent somewhere, but it's still very bright. Mercury is very bright at its elongation. So yeah, uh, this is taken by uh, Juan Luis. Okay, so it's a very uh, beautiful picture right here. It reminds us that a lot of things in astronomy uh, actually shares uh, similar, uh, similarities to what we know. Okay, so this is our last picture for the month. So this, uh, this is a, it looks like a very artistic picture. It looks like something out of a fictional alien world or something. It looks like a monster. But I this, picture, this is the best picture for, for, for this month. Very nice. Yeah, this is a very interesting, picture, very colorful as well. So this is actually the galactic center. Okay, but in radio wavelength. So you're thinking like, oh my God, why, why so many colors? Why I, like you never you look at a nice guy you won't see this thing so this is not visible like this is radio and why radio is because that if it's not radio we technically cannot even see all of this because of the dust lanes uh the interstellar dust uh at the plane of the galactic uh, yeah at the galactic plane so radio waves are not really affected by the extinction due to the interstellar dust so yeah most of the studies conducted about the galactic center is conducted inside the radio wavelength band. Okay, so this is Sagittarius A, which is our uh, supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. So yeah, this is the Milky Way. And yeah, you can notice all of these are Sagittarius because the galactic center is at the uh, constellation of Sagittarius. And what are this? What are this? So SNR is supernova remnant. So this is actually a star that died and a boom. So this is their remnant. And then the remnant is actually emitting or reflecting all those radio waves to us here. And this is also a, a either an older one or a closer one. Okay. That, that is also a supernova, the death of a star. Uh, this is also a SNR. Okay. A supernova remnant. And then then what about all these filaments? What, what, what are these? This looks like some grand design uh, structure, mega structure built by like Kardashev type 3 civilizations. We don't know what's them actually. Like even uh, the airport uh, curator here, he says that other sources in the image are not well understood, including the arc, which is the arc here. So they actually still don't understand why uh, this happens. So maybe if you guys have any idea why there is an arc of radio uh, light emitting from all these filaments or this arc here, okay, you can maybe you can comment down here in the comments. Then maybe we can have a nice discussion over this. Maybe uh, we will we'll send your uh, suggestion to NASA and then maybe they can have a, a good research into that direction. So yeah, this is taken by the. Uh, yeah, it's the that that's the color processing is, uh, is by John Carlos, and then the image credit is given to Oxford University, uh, Mr. Ian Haywood, uh, and it's taken by the South African uh, Radiant Radio Astronomy Observatory. So, uh, and actually, one thing is very special about the radio uh, radio observatories is that usually there's uh, it's not just one telescope, it's not just like one Subaru telescope or one uh. William M. Keck telescope. Uh, they usually use an array of telescopes because of the um, the large wavelength of the radio light. Yeah, because of the large wavelength of radio. So to reach a good resolution, you need a very, very large diameter. And what they do is they use interferometry, like, like what we do with the Event Horizon Telescope. So Event Horizon Telescope is also, it's not, in radio wave, it's in sub millimeter range, but it's still much, much more longer than the visible wavelength. So if you look at the South African telescope array, then that's actually a lot of them. So this is actually just one side of it. There's actually multiple sides of multiple telescopes combined together to form the uh, array that takes the picture right here. So this is actually a very expensive picture as well. So yeah. So I think, yeah, I think that's all for this month.
Uh, Dr. Chong, you're muted. Very nice explanation, both Jenshin and uh, and uh, Bunwei. Yeah? yeah, yeah, very nice. So, have you seen any any question? I saw four people there. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, Jenshin, can you go back to the the last picture? All right. I just want to give a comment. But that's the best picture for this one. I say very nice. Can you imagine? So the, the universe uh, is more imaginative than us. Even a, a, a very crazy artist uh, cannot paint like that. So the question asks, it, wow, I got green color, the art, got yellow color. No, no, no. Radio wavelength. So remember, radio wavelength is in megahertz, gigahertz. Whereas optical wavelength is in petahertz. So it's a much lower frequency than visible light. So if you want to put this picture in radio wavelength, the whole picture is black. Black, totally black, don't see anything. So basically, to do it is what? False color imaging. So that means the arc maybe has a certain radio frequency. That means a certain uh, energy. Remember, energy is equal to H nu, right? And H and uh, nu is equal to C upon lambda. So energy is equal to H C divided by lambda. So different wavelength would have different radio energy. So this is the radio energy of the arc. But our human eye cannot see. Visible eye light cannot see. So they paint it to have a uh, uh, false color. Lah. So the different uh, radio wavelength, different frequency, different energy, we have different color. Lah. And you look at the fine detail. Now the fine detail is not the the people in Milka. Now Milka, as you said, is a, what you call a real radio telescope in South Africa. They purposely paint. This is the actual data. So every single in, uh, thing here is not Tipu one, black people. They actually get the, the raw data and process to be like that. So nice. So nice. Yeah. Okay, uh, Dr. Sean, do you want to give the closing remark? Yeah, okay. Huh? Thank you, Justin. All right. So, okay. So, we we hope our our Malaysian public will come to our website more and more. We, we, we tell them they can learn some astronomy and also they can improve our way of presentation. Okay. So, now we are getting up some, some big event. So, recently, our society committee, we had a meeting and I, I announced that, uh, what do you call, we had a recent GMAC meeting, Global Malaysian Astronomers Convention 2023. Remember, we wanted in 2019 to have a GMAC 2020, Global Malaysian Astronomers Astronomy Convention in 2020. Main event held in KL, but Roshow, Roshow in Penang, Cebu in Kuching, and Kota Kinabalu in Sabah. But because of the pandemic, they de delayed for two years. So now it will be held in January 2023. Oh, you wait again. All right. It will be in January 16, 17, 18, 2023, where many Malaysian professional astronomers who are working in Malaysia, but many, many of them are working overseas, coming back to Malaysia. So we're going to meet the Malaysian people in KL, in Penang, in Kuching, in Kota Kinabalu. All right. So mark your calendar, January 2023. So the uh, main event will be held in KL, but the roadshow will be held in Penang also. So we hope in Penang, we want to do a big event. So one way we hope to build, uh, to book the USM big graduation hall. Remember, graduation hall, uh, the ground floor and the terrace are uh, 2,500 people. Now. <laughs> so we hope to book it, big one. So we hope to have uh, maybe three or four or five Malaysian assortment to come back to Penang and talk talk to, to, talk to our Penang people. Uh, uh, and hopefully, in KL and other parts of Malaysia. So GMAC 2023 will be held in January next year. All right. Any any other thing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah? So for me is enough. Anything for you to wrap up, Justin and Bunwei? Yeah? Bunwei, anything to wrap up? No, no, I got nothing to say. <laughs> so now we are gearing up for Get ready every day. I'm going to read about JWST, www, web, web, web. So we hope in June this year, the detail from web will come out and then we will see a lot of discovery. Remember, the, the professional astronomers have been saying for ages, you know, ages mean 10 years or more, the data from web is working well. We'll rewrite the textbook. A lot of things in the textbook have been changed. So we get ready for web. So we hope that in future, Ending karma, if uh, life is in, in Malaysia, right, we are going to talk a lot about web pictures from web. James Webb Space Telescope, which is now successfully parked in the 
L2 diverging point of the sun and earth, right? And it's now slowly now calibrating all its all its equipment. And like that's why Jason said they're testing. And remember, Jason, huh? in James Webb Space Telescope, like many of the space telescopes, there are many, many uh, equipment, one for spectroscopy, one for this. Each equipment huh, will be run by a principal investigator, a PI. And the principal investigator is, a, say, a professor in America, say this university, New York University, and a team of researchers working under him just to run that equipment. Another equipment in James Webb is another principal investigator, all right, run by another university professor in America with a team around him. And some of the team members may be from Europe, from Japan, other countries. So it's a huge team of scientists. And James Webb is managed by what? SCSCI, Space Telescope Science Institute, University of Baltimore, uh, John Hopkins, uh, uh, no, uh, Baltimore, uh, it's called Maryland. Right? Remember, SCSCI is the institute that runs the Hubble. So now the institute that runs the Hubble, very busy. One big section for years, Hubble. So Hubble is closing down, and the next one will be taken over by James Webb. So that institute will be very busy in the years to come, right? So we are gearing up for web, web, web. <laughs> okay, huh? Okay, okay. So we can end now. So thank you everyone for watching and listening. Okay, thank you, Jochin, Michael, and uh, Goodwin. Thank you. Okay, good night. Okay.